Here in North America, we're lucky to get first dibs on some pretty amazing electric vehicles from companies like Tesla, General Motors, and Rivian. However, outside of North America, there are a number of desirable EVs that are already being manufactured or are coming to market, which have no planned North American release. So if you live in North America, what are you missing out on? Today, I'm gonna to share with you five forbidden fruits. That's cars you can't buy in North America, but we wish you could. And a note here before we get going, while you may hear some of these prices and think, well, that's not very cheap, which I know people will, I read the comments, I need to remind you that in Europe, it's common for prices of vehicles, in fact, prices of anything, to be inclusive of sales taxes. In other words, for example, UK prices include a 20% sales tax or value-added tax as it's known. So bear in mind all of that before you convert whatever the currency is to your local currency. First up is the Renault Zoe. This is a car which is very familiar to most Europeans. It was first debuted in 2012 and the Zoe has claimed plenty of fans since it went into production. This is unsurprising because Renault has repeatedly updated the vehicle with a longer range battery and new features. For 2020, it gained its largest battery pack yet, 52 kilowatt hours, which translates to an impressive 245 miles of range on the WLTP test cycle. It's classed as a super mini, and the Zoe is an ideal car for urban commuting, but its new longer range pack made it a very capable car on a road trip. It can seat four comfortably, uh, five if you're willing to get cozy in the back and add a third person. Trunk or boot space is quite good for a vehicle of its class, in case you're curious, and Renault advertises it as having 338 litres. Those who need more space can fold the rear seats down because it's a hatchback, but say goodbye to passengers. In the UK, buyers can currently pick up a Zoe for £29,495 sterling, excluding any government grants. But the biggest drawback for the Zoe, other than its quite plasticky interior, is its maximum charge rate. At just 50 kilowatts, you can theoretically add 90 miles of driving range every 30 minutes. At one point, that was considered good, but these days, not so much. Next up on our list is the MG ZS EV. For those unaware, MG is a British automaker with a long history that includes many, many changes in ownership, and its latest is the SAIC Motor Corporation, so it's kind of Chinese. Over the past few years, MG has begun to churn out some pretty competitive vehicles. The ZS EV is MG's first attempt at a fully electric vehicle, and the metric which stands out with this car is value for money, because at just £28,495 sterling in the UK, before any government grants, the ZS EV is one of the most affordable electric cars you can buy in Europe. Unlike the Renault Zoe, which is classed as a super mini, the ZS EV is a subcompact crossover which instantly wins its points in a world where crossovers are king. There's also rumoured to be an estate or a station wagon variant on the way. That said, the quick charge rate, which, like the Zoe, is limited to 50 kilowatts. The compromise for all of this? range. With a 44.5 kilowatt hour battery pack, you can only get 163 miles from a full charge on the WLTP test cycle. The ZS EV is designed to be an affordable entry point into the EV world and its low price earns it a spot on this list. I should also note that the ZS EV is available across many other markets around the world, including India and China, although it's sold as a different named vehicle. For several years, Volkswagen has been teasing its new electric compact hatchback, which last year was given the production name of the Volkswagen ID3. At the moment, Volkswagen is preparing to deliver the first production ID3s to customers, but while Europeans will get to enjoy this new, pretty impressively specced versions of what Volkswagen thinks an electric car could be, Volkswagen has maintained that it has no plans at all to bring the ID3 to North America. And we all think that's a big mistake. The ID3, in its top range version, boosts an advertised range of 340 miles on the WLTP test cycle. And plenty of people in urban and suburban areas would love its stylish appearance and reportedly peppy performance. The ID3 will be available in Europe with a range of different battery packs at different price points. In France, for example, the entry level model, so called ID3 Pure, will start at 39,990 euro before any government grants. 
That model has a 45 kilowatt hour battery pack and a predicted range of up to 205 miles on the WLTP test cycle. Frankly, that's pretty good value for money. And all but the entry level ID3s are capable of charging at 100 kilowatts at DC quick charging stations, which can recharge the batteries by about 290 kilometers in 30 minutes. The ID3 also comes with 385 litres of boot space and a relatively spacious five seat interior. While the ID4 is coming to North America, the entire team is a little sad that we're not going to get to get our hands on the ID3. Citroen Peugeot, PSA to its friends, has been at the forefront of compact hatchbacks for years. And while you may not know this, PSA is no stranger to electric vehicles, having made limited production electric vehicles in the late 90s, about the same time that Toyota and General Motors were working on electric cars in the US. Now, the company, which recently added Opel to its list of brands after buying it from GM, is working hard to electrify its various European models. The Peugeot E208 and Opel Corsair E, that's Vauxhall Corsair E to all of our British viewers, are both excellent additions to the EV world. I know, that's two cars, but they're essentially the same car, so you're getting two for the price of one. They're both built on the same platform and have almost the same specs. The Peugeot has a 217 mile WLTP range, while the Opel has a 209 mile WLTP range, each from the same 50 kilowatt hour battery packs. Both vehicles can recharge from empty to 80% in around 30 minutes at a 100 kilowatt capable CCS fast charger. The main difference, of course, comes with their interiors and their grills, but these stylistic differences are subjective, and so I'd suggest it's up to each buyer to determine their favourite. The E208 starts at £29,025 sterling, and the Corsa E starts at £30,665 sterling. Both of those are before government grants. The last car on our list is another small, fun city car, the Honda E. It attracted a lot of attention when it was first introduced at the 2017 Frankfurt Motor Show as the Honda Urban EV concept. And since then, Honda has brought the vehicle out of the concept car stage and it's now producing it. Honda advertises a 137 mile WLTP range, which is not much, especially considering the 26,660 pounds sterling price tag, which already includes government grants. But honestly, the Honda E is not trying to be a cheap city car. Like the Mini E and the Fiat 500e, it's aimed not at entry-level customers, but at those who have some extra cash lying around and want a fun, stylish, small runabout. It is essentially a premium fashion statement. Honda has worked hard to make the interior feel comfortable and pretty futuristic. The dashboard consists of screens that run all the way from one side of the car to the other, and so the price of the Honda E is not just a reflection of its driving range, but also its interior specs too. Unlike the Zoe and the ID3 with their longer ranges, the Honda E is arguably only good at being a city car, but it does pretty well. I'm not going to lie, with the range it currently has, it's not going to sell in North America, as most folks I've spoken to expect at least 160 miles or more before buying. But given that most people live in urban areas and rarely drive more than 100 miles in a single day, the Honda E could make a great second car or even a primary first car for those with enough money to pay for form before function. So there you have it, five electric cars that aren't sold in North America, but which everyone on the team kind of wishes were. Well, some of these brands aren't actually selling at all in North America, Renault, Peugeot, Citroen and MG for example. It does raise one question. Why is it that some automakers choose not to sell their electric cars from other markets in North America? There are, of course, multiple reasons. One is that North American customers tend to prefer larger vehicles, which even in Europe are not being electrified at the same pace as smaller city cars and those compact crossovers. Time and time again, we hear auto industry executives use the excuse that Americans just won't buy a small car. And there is some evidence to back that up. Smart car, anybody? But the biggest reason why these cars aren't coming to North America, we think, is probably something else. Legislation in Asia and Europe are pretty tough on vehicle tailpipe emissions. And now more and more countries on both continents are pushing automakers to produce zero or low emission vehicles through tougher fleet emissions targets and sometimes even zero emission mandates. 
And that's fantastic for both Europe and Asia because these policies are positively impacting the trajectory of vehicle development. But the disparity between policies in North America and Europe take away the incentives for automakers to sell those vehicles in North America. Because in the US, as I'm sure most of you know, the federal government is trying to roll back emissions targets and roll back environmental protections, much to the horror of many citizens. And while other North American countries have their own standards, the US is the largest automotive market in North America and thus tends to dictate in many ways what vehicles are available in other North American markets. The transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles will probably happen organically due to public pressure and market forces, but without government intervention acting as a catalyst as it has in Europe, well, it's going to take a lot longer. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, please don't hesitate to like, comment and subscribe, and let us know if you agree with the list in the comments section. If you're able to support the show, please do so using the links below because they pay for things like lights. We have Ko-fi, Patreon and Bitcoin, and it really does help to keep the bills paid and the cameras rolling. If you want to chat with the team again, please join us on Discord. There's a special link below. And if you're a Patreon supporter, you can also gain access to our special Patreon only Discord channels. Thanks to the folks scrolling by on my right. They are our charged up patrons. And thanks also go to Jeffrey Songster, John Lyons and Ray Jean Fellows, who are our self-driving patrons. And special thanks to our Starman level patrons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback and Sean Udea. Don't forget that there's a new video on this channel almost every day. That includes TEN, our weekly roundup show, which comes out every Saturday, just in time for your afternoon cup of tea or lazy morning breakfast, depending on where you live in the world. And if you're looking for more stuff to watch, then Google thinks you might enjoy this one over here. So check it out. Until next time, wash your hands, stay safe and work to become a better kind of person. Strive for quality and remember to treat others as you'd like to be treated. Finally, I would like to thank our newest member of the team, Morgan, who wrote today's script. It's the first one he's ever written for filming on this channel. So please share your love with him in the comments. Thanks for joining me and until next time, keep evolving.